here we go. We're starting the podcast today. We have Ben Prendergast, the voice actor for Fuse, and I'm so excited to talk to you. How are you doing today? I'm well, thank you, Owen. Lovely to be here with you. Yeah. Uh, thanks for inviting me along. Oh, I mean, of course. It's it's such an exciting, exciting thing to learn about these voice actors who who play these characters. Not only just one character, but you have a plethora of other things under your belt that I'm so excited to, to get to know about. And um, yeah, thank you for being here. Hey, I do. Um, I'm, I'm, you're welcome. And just quickly, like, what level of interest do you have in the craft of voice acting or acting? Oh. It is an it is an ever growing interest. I'm not super interested in doing it myself, but one thing that I am so interested in is is bringing. I don't feel like people give enough credit, and right. because I feel like a lot of people think it's just delivering lines, but it's not. They're you're acting, and I don't like when like people. They differentiate so much like there's this like it seems like people think there's such a like big line but like there's just there's some i'm sure there's little nuances like but it is you are delivering a character and like when yeah, and, yeah. i mean i know myself like mm -hmm. if i've ever played a game or even to watch movies or whatever and, I, and i'd be like oh, i could do that voice but yeah you can do the voice but yeah. can you create the voice like can you create Mm -hmm. uh, the character so you're right it's um it, you know it takes a lot of experience to get to the place where it does just feel like you're doing lines like when i go in for new stuff for fuse i kind of drop into him with certain techniques but um by and large you know once you've created that character he's kind of rusted on as it were um and yeah i mean you know it, it's it's kind of interesting to me because i'm i'm relatively new not to voiceover but definitely to voicing characters for video games like mm. i've been you know working for um 15 um years or you know professionally as an actor and um and but all the same skills apply um, i know some voice actors get actually a little bit um pissy about not being called actors or whatever mm -hmm. um i don't really care i don't really care i don't get that offended about that i've done I've done acting in most forms that you could name and um, they all have their, they're all fun and they all have their kind of pros and cons. Um, but, but voice acting, especially for Apex is kind of a, a blessing really, because, you know, the fan base is so, um, they're just so excited and so kind of, you know, lovely to, to us. Um, as a result, like aside from the fact that respawn actually hire somehow have a magic wand to hire, um, no dickheads. <laughs> so every, every one of those people on that cast are all just like nice people. Um, maybe there's something about that too. Mm -hmm. mm. There, there is something else about you that I'm super interested, in, and I do want to start out with this: is I love Australia. I love it. I want to know wh where were you born at? I was born, raised, and lived the majority of my life in Melbourne. Um, okay. I grew up sort of just outside of Melbourne, like 40 minutes sort of northwest, a place called Sunbury. And then, um, I, you know, for most of my adult life, I lived in the CBD, like right in the center of Melbourne, which is like the southernmost, not the southernmost, but like the southern sort of capital city. And Australia's all upside down. So it's cold down south and it's hot up north. And, okay. Uh, my family lives up north. My family, my dad lives in the middle middle east side of australia and then my mum lives in the northeast side um and the majority of the population is on that sort of eastern seaboard like you see australia and like the whole eastern seaboard is like you know most of the population is on this strip of land mainly because it's kind of habitable um yeah and there, are, there are other places but it's you know it's the most biodiverse one of the most biodiverse countries in the world and um it's kind of funny when i come back where i live now which is in los angeles and um or when I travel back to Australia, I kind of miss the sounds, even the smells and the quality of the light is different. And it's just, um, in Australia. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. What's weird about Australia. We went back there, uh, for, um, supernova convention, uh, last month, or the month before last. And, um, we got off the plane and we live in a sunny part of, you know, LA, all of LA is sunny, but we live in, you know, 
where it's bright, <laughs> but you get off the plane and you squint because it's like you can't deal with, with how sharp the light is. It's a weird thing. It's a weird thing. And then, you know, the birds sound different. Like the actual, it's like you're on another planet because just all of the birds are different. And mm-hmm. It's like it's a different set of sounds. It's it's kind of it's kind of nice to go back and experience that. But yeah, you have to go. Yeah, that's what I I did a I watched a lot. I do I did a lot, like I said, for this interview. Um, and I even watched stuff about Australia. I was very interested, like you said, like the there's just this strip of land that's like most of the population, which it's not super like highly dense. Or I guess it is dense population. It's not like scattered out at all. Like a lot of the major cities make up the whole population of Australia. I thought that was super interesting. Yeah, it's um, it's hard to kind of size that for people, but you know, if you think about Australia, is I think it's roughly the size of the states, not including Alaska. Yeah. And then per like Western Australia, one of our states is four times the size of Texas, <laughs> and and you're like, oh, but there's like a million people live there, or two million people. And then Melbourne, where I'm from, is like there's five million people there. So the population of Melbourne is roughly the population of like LA City, but not LA, not not California, obviously. Like mm-hmm. California is twice the population of the whole of Australia. And so it's just like it's hard to work all that out. And then the distances, man. Like I remember there was um there were these like um Swedish backpackers or something who were in Melbourne and they were just gonna um like backpack to Perth. Um that's a 38 hour drive <laughs> <laughs> like and there's like one city like there's one major city in between like adelaide and um and it's like you know 120 degrees out there in the middle of the desert pretty much yeah um so yeah it's it, but yes yeah, like you know melbourne sydney brisbane and and the thing about australia is you don't ever want to like forget a city like i get in trouble if i don't mention like tasmania or adelaide or certainly perth like but perth which is on the west side they're like I think that city is known as the most geographically um, separated city from from another major city on the planet. Like it's just like so far from anywhere, and um, but it's you know it's a really cool city. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Have you been to a lot of like the major cities in Australia? Yeah, um, I haven't I haven't toured extensively. I've spent like you know weeks at a time in most of the cities um but then i've like toured with shows and spent like you know three days in like darwin or you know, mm-hmm. two days in, in tasmania um and then there's just like whole sections of the country that i've never never seen you know mm-hmm. yeah like any yeah. really yeah I, I remember you saying like when you in your early teen years maybe like like 10 to 12 or something that you were getting into that's when you started playing guitar, right? Yeah. I, I, what was like, was there a reason that you started playing guitar at all? Yeah, I was, I was, uh, I wanted to impress the girls. I think. Oh, <laughs> oh, yeah, nice. That's why anyone plays an instrument, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, my mom or my dad was running into the saxophone and then. Oh, I played saxophone as well. Right? And yeah. like, like when you first started, like I played it at high school and like the they wanted me to play clarinet and then we started out on the recorder and then i finally got the saxophone my dad was like he was so excited until i started to play the thing badly and then he was like "Ooh!" <laughs> but you know my dad was he calls himself a guitarist he's not really but he was like, a guitarist in the band. And my uncle was a guitarist and some of my earliest memories are just like you know having a you know having a guitar in mm. the lounge room and just like playing and like plucking it and this magical sound that came out of it um but i but I went through all these other things, like my mum used to take me to do karate, and then I'd go and play football, and then I'd do all these other things, and some of them stuck, and some of them didn't. And then when it came to like, I think it was like, I think it was about fourteen or something, I started taking guitar lessons, and my guitar teacher was like this metal metal as dude, and he was like had long black hair. His name was Mark Robson, <laughs> and then, and he had like he had like two small hands, but his fingers were like super dexterous, and he and he taught me back in black the album the acdc mm. that's the first songs i ever learned which is kind of kind of crazy when you think about it because that's just like straight up metal um but i remember there was my friend had a birthday party i think he was having a sleepover he was turning 15 and there was all these like dudes around and and, and little girls at the party but he um 
in his room he had this guitar and he played smoke on the water um and i was like wow you know i've got a and the bug bit then but it was weird like i've been playing now for it's gotta be 30 no longer yeah 30 years or something that's super interesting was it so do you think like acdc got you into it or what was the the um the musical inspiration there like when you were just learning what were you what were you listening to? um well it was this really weird and amazing time in music because grunge was just coming up and like you know around about that time i think it was like you had pearl jam but then and my dad was always into like Soundgarden. and my dad was into metal it was crazy he was like <laughs> sabbath and my dad would play all this stuff and then he like bought me a pantera cd and i was like but i was really into like the beatles and um but in 1991 or something which is ancient history for you <laughs> <laughs> i was a kid there was like um that year like the um, nirvana teen uh teen spirit came out red hot chili peppers Pearl Jam 10, all these amazing guitar-based um, albums. And so it was like, you know, I'd go down to the news agent, I'd pick up a Guitar World magazine, and I'd just be learning these amazing songs that were coming out. Um, and then you'd go to parties and just pull out and play the guitar or just, you know, or I started bands a little bit after that, but I was just vibing on, like, learning these amazing songs and, and figuring out how they were making all these sounds. Um, yeah, it's, you know, in a lot of ways, I think I, I could have and should have gone down that path of being of dedicating myself to being a musician more than anything else but you know what are you going to do yeah wherever it takes you you know i love it i i feel like a lot of so many actors and voice actors that i hear a lot of them started off with music and i don't know why that is is do you think there's a reason or like i just feel like like gabe kunda i know like who just joined the cast he's that man is so talented on every on every step of the way but i mean he, he does he does has an acapella group and like they're amazing yeah. it's amazing yeah I love gabe. um yeah gabe mella um al's the singer justine's like does show tunes um i think a lot of the cast can can sing mm -hmm. i think to your question of like what makes a voice actor get into voice acting as well um you have a pro you know your your ability to like learn how a mic works and the proximity of the mic and what your mic what your voice sounds like really close comes from like playing in bands and like trying to sing over a, a guitar or something yeah. and getting a quality of voice out of that without like it being disgusting is is kind of a skill and so when if you add acting to that mix it sort of makes sense because I know a lot of actors who come to a microphone and they actually don't know what they're doing like they'll be they they'll make a lot of mouth sounds because. You know, there are intricacies to voice acting and being on a mic that, I mean, you, you might even know yourself, like, if you've eaten, a, I don't eat dairy, but if you've eaten dairy, then you'll have like a claggy sound in your mouth. And if you've like, if you're, um, you can get a lot of mouth sounds, you can get a lot of, like, if you're not breathing properly, then you uh -huh. can get the words out. If you're not enunciating correctly, then the world, words can sound wrong. Um, so I think singers kind of naturally get that and then when they come to like being voice actors they and they're, they're actors as well it's kind of a nice um a nice crossover there and they're not the other thing is that they're not freaking out when they first get put in front of a mic because you know when you're acting often you're acting opposite either a lens sure but like acting acting like on a stage or on film but like with another actor the sort of way that works intrinsically is that you're working with another human being opposite you and it's much easier to arrive at something that's real and, and emotions that actually affect you and you're trying to affect that other person as a character. And that's what creates the magic when you're actually watching it again. But you put a, like a metal box in front of someone and now it's sort of, it becomes, you, you, just, you have to be careful not for that to become fake in a way because your imagination has to be all the, all the more stronger just to kind of be surprising and not be like obvious in the choices that you make. Um, that's another thing that's another sort of skill that I guess singers also have is because they're, they're, they're not they're singing to an audience and that's that's I guess a thing but they're not singing to a specific person having to be thinking about who they're who they're singing to yeah like uh, imagination when it comes to voice acting I would assume is very important because you have to think like how 
how the scene would actually be like without having it right in front of you and how someone else is gonna like maybe you're the first person to record the lines and you don't have any lines back to you and like you like, if it's an interaction or something like that so I, I assume it's it's a lot harder than people give it credit for when it comes to the actual acting part of your imagination and getting into that character it's really rare especially now since the pandemic to ever do a scene in a voiceover context with another actor yeah uh, all of those fuse hound lines um you know it's only been recently that um um oh look that is a word it's only been recently that um that's coming back where people are actually acting in a booth with another actor um but yeah it's um yeah and, and it's surprising to people like when you when i get an audition and, and the other thing to come back to your point of like uh, it must be not it must be easy but people think it could be easy to do this yeah often i'm going up against a couple hundred people for a role and mm -hmm. if you in my my what i think um if you just lay down exactly what the casting director has actually put in front of you like you'll get you'll get a some text and the text will be all right he's he's an older guy he's like 45 to 50 he's got a gravelly voice and he um you know he's just like evil through and through or something like that you kind of already can imagine the kind of voices they're going to get back right and then the client sitting there going all right i'm gonna and i click play and i listen to someone and they're like really old and creaky and they're just completely evil and then you're, and then along comes someone who's like maybe a little nicer or, something, or, or um or or a little more sort of divisive or whatever and it just it just pings it just hits different to the client who's listening trying to find that one out of you know a couple of hundred voices mm -hmm. um yeah it's um but you know sometimes i still think i haven't found the answer like i'm still improving and i still like i still put out like tons and tons and tons of auditions that i just don't book both in voiceover land and as an actor you know on, on screen stuff um and, and then it's hard and one of the other tricks as an actor's skills as an actor is just to not let that bother you because if you do then you can tend to get a bit desperate and you can tend to make choices that you tend to make go back to making safe and boring choices um it's a bit like life really like if you're just going to do the thing that everyone else has done then you're just following this kind of path that someone else is going to be better at you that so you, the only thing you can do is try and walk your own path and try and find your own ways into things you know yeah that's what i talk a lot with um with a lot of the voice actors that i talk about a good question that i i love resor uh, resorting to is do you feel like you should uh or like that people like directors know what they want and that you should try to stick to that or is it important to to show them what they want and like like they don't uh, like obviously like sometimes they're going to be like i want you know this specific voice and if they really have that in their head um but maybe sometimes they don't know what they want until they hear it exactly you got to give them what they didn't know they wanted to hear yeah <laughs> yeah and like you know and it's not just them making a decision like they might get really excited about one or two voices and then they go to studio and the studio is like well no we take this person over this person because of xyz or this i don't know this person's my friend i don't know how much that happens <laughs> you know, it happens and that's the job of an actor is, is um like often the director or and often the director doesn't know what they want like flat out doesn't know what they want mm -hmm. and they're not very good at describing what they want so the director doesn't know what they want they're not very good at describing what they want to the casting director who does their very best to describe what they think the director wants and then that goes out and then 200 people like attempt to you know um uh you know code decodify that and mm -hmm. translate that into something that relates to them and so we you know my wife and i and my friends who are actors it's like we, we talk about that a lot it's like a job an actor's job is translation like all the time flat out it's like okay what what is actually needed in this scene like when you have access to good writing and you're like i know what's needed in this scene not only for my character to get what they want but also saying you know like for the audience like what is the audience like what would be enthralling for an audience to receive and then what can i do 
to sort of make that a little more exciting or make that a little, little unique or give the audience what they didn't know they wanted to see. Like that's that's the job of an actor. And then, but at the same time, the whole like if you try and manufacture that in a kind of this is how I'm going to say this line way, then you get into this other level of fakery. So it's kind of like you're you're setting up this environment inside your own heart and soul, so that when something you know, something, a bit of direction comes in or another line from another actor comes in, your kind of instrument is free enough and you're not embarrassed and your instrument is like free enough to actually put something out there that often, if it's good and if it's working, will actually surprise you as well. And then there's the trick of like, don't get too excited about something you've just done that felt surprising to you and you're like proud of or like pride is going <laughs> to bring you down just as quickly, you know? Yeah. It's um, it's an endlessly fasc fascinating pursuit. For sure. Yeah, it seems like it seems like a like a never ending pursuit almost. Like I, but going back a, a little bit to to Australia, you you had talked about a little bit um, about how the arts were not as prominent in Australia, and I want to know what like you said you could go through um, just kind of the there's like a round of like, is it like soap op soap operas or like, um, yeah. there's soap operas. There's like pr um, uh, procedurals. There's like there's a there's a bunch of well known Australian TV shows. Yeah, and, and more coming through. Yeah, and so like why why is that that we we aren't seeing more from like why is it so not prominent in Australia? Um, that's a really good question. And I actually get into trouble a little bit when I talk about, <laughs> when, I, when I, when I just like say how I feel about the industry there. And uh -huh. often it's like, well, you know, if you were, if, if you were better then you would have made it. And I was like, well, you know, I, I'm okay with what I did, like in terms of the, the theater work that I did and how I grew. Mm -hmm. as an actor. And, you know, and, and I know I'm a better actor now than what I was when I was working in Australia. But I think, um, it was problematic for a long time because well there's not the population thing right so you start with there's only 27 million people in australia mm -hmm. then you go okay well there's streamers netflix is throwing some money on people but then there's like four tv stations and then they do shows and when a tv station does a show then you know the the advertising money that was getting thrown at those shows is nowhere near what it's like in the states and so all of those factors combine so that they're trying to make shows that appeal to people who buy Holdens and Fords and tra travel by a Qantas and, you know, drink Coca-Cola, right? So they're, so they're already trying to just pitch shows to those people. And then they can't afford to hire more than one writer. So you, one or two writers. So often you've got one writer who's like, let's make this show. He pitches it, he or she pitches it to the network um, and the network picks it up. And then by the time it gets cast and produced, they have to mitigate all this risk. And so what they do is they will go to, you know, the people who have been on Australian TV for 20 years and they will give them roles. And it makes perfect sense because some people follow those people. And so then you get the same faces and the same kinds of shows and there's, you're never really pushing the boundaries unless they're trying to push those shows internationally. So you can even get stuff like The Wiggles or kids' TV shows like Bluey or... Um, uh, you know, Love on the Spectrum, an amazing show on Netflix, which got picked up for a U.S. series. Um, until they until they get access to U.S. money, it's never going to be pushing. It's always going to be very you know white bread down the middle, and it's kind of boring. and And then what happens is the Australian public gets sick of it, and then they just start pouring money into reality TV because that's something that um, is easy to shoot. They don't have to pay talent to do it. Uh, it's not risky, and mm -hmm. people sort of lap it up. So. It's complex, and I'm and, and I'm just talking about TV. You know, then there's film, which is another thing, and then you know, theater is another thing. But you know, Australia has was the, one of the original filmmakers. You know, Australians made one of the I think the first ever feature film was made in Australia, and then people obviously go on to be really famous filmmakers from Australia, but they leave the country. Mm -hmm. Australia makes about twenty eight feature films a year. I think last year they made like they during the pandemic they made like three feature films, and I was like, wow, that makes sense. Yeah. Um, so to answer your question, just I think I'd say it's lack of population and um, lack of um, you know gusto. Like the, the risk taking isn't there. That's all I would say. And the people who do take the risks, like 
everyone's like, why isn't someone, you know, why isn't, why aren't there more Baz Luhrmann's out there? Why aren't there more, you know, where's the power of the dog? You know, um, where are the Jane Campions? Um, it's because it's hard to take risks. Um, and, and I think that's true. I think that's true anywhere. Although when I first came over here, I was like, look, I've been able to book stuff in Australia most, you know, most months or years I was working. And I was like, if I go to America, I should be able to just like get off the plane and just like book the same amount of stuff. And I got off the plane and I was like, I'm starting again. You were starting again in, in my forties. I was starting again. I was like, oh man, I'm really skilled at this, but like I need to, you know, make, make new friends and get good representation. And luckily the lane that they let me swim in, which I always say is, um, is in, in voiceover and video games. So, mm-hmm. um, yeah, it's, as, as you know, it's tricky to get something off the ground and like, and, and commit to something long-term as well. Like that deferred gratification of going, I'm going to do this thing for like three years or six years or even six months and see what happens. Um, it's hard to get that stuff off the ground. Yeah, they always say um, it's a big thing in the creator space where people say is uh, the hardest thing that you're gonna do is get your first 100 subscribers. Like from that from that first jump, like obviously I I can't even I couldn't even tell you the blood, sweat, and tears that I went through for for just the first hundred subscribers. I uploaded every single day for like four months straight, like just every day, no matter what I was doing, I uploaded. But like, and then that's how I got my first hundred subscribers was that, but it's, it, it resonates with a lot of things. Like just that initial jump, getting into that routine or whatever, like actually doing something or, um, just the first start of anything is difficult. It's very difficult. And I'm sure it's a, obviously a different kind of blood, sweat and tears, but I've heard, I've heard you quote saying like a hundreds of auditions for things yeah, was, was it 700 before I, when i landed here yeah so get the 20 years of my career before when i landed here and i got my first voice agent um it was about 750 or something auditions yeah. before i booked something decent i booked little things or i did things for free but i mean when did you start um well i started under the name texture back like 2014 like I was, I've been creating for a, a, a long time, um, but nothing super serious. And then I created this YouTube channel and um, I started uploading like gaming videos and stuff like that. Uh, so that's what I primarily did, but I've, I've done so many different things. Like from what I started, I started with Call of Duty, like, and I used the sniper the whole time. And that's all I did. And then... Um, I got into vlogging. I even did cinematography and like one of my biggest goals in life was to uh go into filmmaking and I would I would write scripts, I would uh make cinematic. I did weddings, I did um fashion shows, just like anything I could get my hands on, free stuff, everything. And um I really love the art of I love cinematography and storytelling and that's kind of i kind of do that here as like a back kind of like a backhanded type thing where i i try to tell a story i try to get someone else to tell their story and i like i love sharing it so it's not exactly the same thing but there's some of the same premise here that i get to sh- share my story and share someone else's story at the same time that's cool man hey quickly what's what's your camera setup you're running right now I have a Sony A7 III, and then I have a 16 to 35 millimeter. Which what's the 16 to 35? It's a G Master lens, and then it is a little, a little pricey. Right, well, I'm yeah. Running, I'm running. A, I I was running a Panasonic. I was looking at the Sony stuff, but this is coming to you through a. I got a Black Magic 6K, which oh, is crazy. Yeah. I, and I have the 16 8, uh, the Sigma 18 to 35 on here. Mm-hmm go sort of that's as, that's as far out as it goes like it's just that <laughs> <laughs> yeah um, i love it man and i just run a little little, little studio mic. i i love the black magic stuff i love it i was i was looking at it for so long yeah but it's weird my webcam but like uh, yeah yeah <laughs> do you use it for anything else at all yeah yeah we've shot we shot um a, a sort of uh, uh, it was 
was like almost a mini feature at the start of the year on this um, mm. setup. Uh, and I was super impressed. I had a, like a Sennheiser 416 just off the top of that um, using the preamps on the camera. And I just had everything, just had the audio and the, and the video. And I had two like decent Astero tubes, you know, the LED tubes. I think I had uh-huh. like four of those and I lit the entire thing and shot and sound recorded the entire thing. And it like, it came out really good. That's yeah. awesome. I'll send you a link. Yeah, I would love to see it. Uh, I, I think, I think it's super interesting since you have a, you have like two older kids. I mean, I know you have more kids than that, but you have like, uh, wh- how old are they now? Uh, they're 19 and 17. Okay. Almost 20, almost 20 turns 20 on the 26th. Um, so Tom and Locke, they live in Melbourne. Okay. Uh, and Yoko, my baby girl, is 16 months old. So there's like a huge gap there when she lives. Mm-hmm. I think it's interesting, like, was there... So you were... You weren't always doing, like... I don't want to say well but like you were you had to still make something happen right when oh, you had yeah. kids oh yeah 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 like um i actually had a i had a, a software business called oh software. yes 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 and I that was that was my income for i want to say from 2002 which was when tom was born uh i was only like 26 27 i just want to let you know i was also born in 2002 though. All right, all right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So you're as old as my eldest son. Yeah, yeah. Um, but and that that business I sold in 2015, so it was a good 13 years or something. And then uh, when I sold that, I had, had a lot of skills in you know web design, web development as a producer, like a digital producer. And, uh, what did you, what language did you did you go in or code in? Um, I was I was mainly producing. So when I was uh-huh. coding, it was like you know JavaScript. Um. Um. Yeah, no, I I, d- I quickly moved on from coding. Like <laughs> back in the day, I was co- coding in C plus plus, and um. But I'm not much of a coder, you know. I'm a I'm a producer. Like I can I can spec a thing out and get someone to build it for me, and that's what I was doing. Um, as a consultant, after I sold Copper, um, which was good because I could go and do that for like you know three months, and then I'd go and do a show like a, a theater show for, you know. Mm-hmm. After that, Usually a theater show is like six weeks rehearsals and six weeks performance. So you're kind of taking up three months on, three months off. Um, and that was, and I had a house as well. Like I bought a house in 20, 2014, which is my, like my second house. I had a house when the boys were, you know, young. And then I bought a second house and then I sold that. And then I moved here and, you know, looking to buy my third house. Um, um, and yeah, it's... um the the life of an artist in Australia is exactly that. Like you have to have, and I think I suspect anywhere where you're just like starting out, but you definitely have to have a second income mm-hmm. uh, until something something takes off. Yeah. yeah, I I know it was super interesting to me because I re- I remember hearing that, and I mean again, like I said, I've done so many things. I I learned a little. N- I'm not very fluent, but I have learned. A couple different types of code and I, I haven't practiced in a while or i wasn't keeping up on my skills so I, I don't know how good i would be now but um yeah i i really love that industry i i dabbled in some html and yeah. um a little bit of java and stuff like that but uh i was so i was so taken back by that i didn't know that about you and when i learned it, i was so excited about that as well yeah i mean i you know the the business that I had was a, a project management software tool for graphic design studios and web design studios, among mm-hmm. other people. Like it was it was a wild time in two thousand and three, two thousand and four when it started to take off. Yeah, I had like NASA was a customer at one point. Um, Sony Pictures Digital. Um, I had a USS. I had a, a the US Navy like was a, a ship that was using the software. Um, and and I had really good developers on that. And obviously had to have really secure servers and everything. So, um, yeah, I, you know, it's weird. Like I've sort of, I've sort of fallen off doing that anymore. Like I'll do it for like, you know, the theater company I was part of, or you know, a real estate company that I work with. And um, I can still, like, I can still build out a WordPress site and do some some pretty pretty clean graphic design. But 
and I know my, my way around, you know, Adobe Premiere and um, so I can cut video and I can scrap together a decent website, but um, it's weird how that has just become a commodity now. Like it's when I started out, like if you could code like HTML, um, you know, you, you could make like a ton of money and you still can. Mm -hmm. well, yeah. Now it's like trying to start out as like a one man shop is impossible. Just do it mm -hmm. myself, do that kind of stuff. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, I was, I moving on a little bit. I, I do want to talk about, uh, the movie you did with Ethan Hawke. Mm -hmm. I think that's, that was really cool. What, what was that experience like working on that? Uh, so this movie was called predestination. Um, yeah, I was struggling saying that a little bit. I don't know why, but go ahead. Yeah. Uh, predestination. Predestination. Yeah. Yeah. But, what do you struggle with? No, I, I just wasn't sure how to, I didn't want to say it wrong. <laughs> I get nervous saying things just in case it's wrong, but yeah. I did this voiceover once for, a, and I'll never forget it. This company was called Prompt Distribution. Mm -hmm. And you try and say those two words together, like really fast in like an ad and I just couldn't do it. <laughs> After a while, I was like, I'm sorry, my mouth's like, I can't do the prompt. <laughs> uh, anyway, um, yeah, th th working with Ethan. So. I originally didn't have scenes with him at all. Like I was supposed to play the doctor who like delivers him as a baby. And um, then I had this like fling with the nurse. And so it was like a couple of scenes. It wasn't a big deal, but the Spiri brothers who are an Australian um, twins um, who directed it wanted me for that role. And that's great. And then at some point, I mean, I, I'm going to give spoilers, but they film is so kind of <laughs> character. Is, um, it's a time travel film and he mm -hmm. um, confronts himself at some point in the film um, at, at the at the finale of the film and um, and my my agent calls me and she's like oh um, do you want to work with Ethan Hawke I was like no what are you talking about <laughs> she's like what they need is they need for you to learn um, like here's the script here's the full script learn like the final it's like the final scene like it's the big showdown with ethan working opposite himself um and you have to it's called a performance uh, uh a performance double so it's not an act it's not an extra or like a, a a background double where you just have to like look like ethan but he needs someone to run the scene with mm -hmm. um, he has to play both sides they're going to turn yeah. around and catch him in that side and i'm like it sounds amazing um she's like okay so you'll need to go and meet you're gonna go meet with the spirits and ethan tomorrow and I'm like, okay, that's cool. So we sit down, I, I drive out to um, Docklands in Melbourne and um, trying to keep a lid on the nerves because then I'm a big fan of Ethan and this and that. And also just to give you con some context, the reason why they wanted me was because I'm literally exactly the same size as Ethan Hawke, something weird, like I'm the same height, I have the same like jacket size. And they're like, cool, if nothing else, this dude can just like stand in the scene and it'll be fine. So we go in and he is like the most lovely guy for a start. And then the spear is like really accommodating. And we sit down in this, it was weird. We sit down in this room and we talk about the script and what we like about it, what we didn't like about it, what we think is happening in the end and how we can make the end work. And I'm like, I'm going to sit off from this and like not say much because it's not my meeting. But I think in hindsight, it was Ethan seeing whether he could, whether he could even tolerate me as an, <laughs> in that scene because he had a he had a bit to do on that scene. Anyway, I gave my advice on, on my my opinion on the end of the script, and then Ethan was like, "Do you agree with me?" He was like, "Yeah, it's like what Dan said. Like, I think it's this, and then it's also this." And he was like, "All he wanted to do was make the film as great as he could for the Spirit." And then the actual, and then you know, I they were fine to get me on board. And then the actual uh, day of filming, I just watched this like absolute boss of an actor, just like crush it the whole day like he was you know he never missed a trick and he was like offering like ad libs uh, off the cuff that were like it's a complicated story and a complicated script but he was like offering these ad libs that were like perfectly in line with what needed to happen in order to resolve the story and and um you know we rehearsed and I you know I knew knew my lines and and then I got to you know shoot Ethan Hawke in the chest um <laughs> which was it was one of the highlights of my career to just sit and watch someone like that uh, in their element, just like mm -hmm. going at it. Um, 
and yeah that was that was a lot of fun also like it was set in like 70s new york and this was being shot in like footscray in melbourne which is like you know the the vietnamese like it's like little vietnam um so all the shops have you know vietnamese signage and there was a laundromat in that suburb and they but they and it's australia so it doesn't snow but they'd put snow everywhere and these old american cars outside i was like where where am i like who am i to be like doing this work Mm. it was so it was such a blessing um yeah, there are other fun things about that shoot. Um, but yeah, I just felt pretty blessed to be part of it. Um, yeah, it's a good film. You should check it out. If uh, anyone watching, you should check it out. Predestination. Yeah, I, I think that's so interesting to, to me. that um, I, I do want to talk a little bit about Apex, obviously. Um, it's just, I think the... Uh, the writing staff i always got to give credit for credits due that the the writing staff and uh the director just everyone who came together to make it what it is like not only is the gameplay obviously very great but there is another element that maybe not people think about much but the characters make the game great and how it flows and how people interact and stuff i do I do want to ask a little bit what what that process was like getting into um if you could just touch on what they what your first impressions of uh what you first got and like the bullet points and how you developed the the voice for fear yeah um so there's always code names when they get you to yeah. audition for these things so this was um this had a code name and then i think you know the code word for my character was like you know d or something <laughs> i don't know if i've talked about it but like they were like d is like he's an explosive he's an expert um it, this was in the writing so i was like we we're looking for i think they were looking for australian they might have been looking for a unique voice australian usually natural accent australian british um new zealand um maybe this i never know like it was so many but i think it was australian um and i don't even think at this point they'd given me much more direction other than he's a bit of a knockabout um guy and he's an explosives expert <laughs> and, and i looked at, and i also look at the lines that they get you to do and i think one of them was like um uh i'm here to um pour a little petrol on the situation was one <laughs> of them. um uh, you could say I'm looking to make a bit of a scene, and when I read, you could say I'm making, to, I'm looking to make a bit of a scene. You know, I go off into a, a bit of a research loop, and I'm like, oh, this person is either a stunt man or an actor or something. And then I was, I didn't even know it was Apex at this point. I actually thought it was like a Marvel, a Marvel thing, like a uh, a Captain Kangaroo or something, um, because I looked up, you know, Australian explosives expert Marvel or something, and and that character came up and I'm like, oh sick you know i'm gonna so i actually went down a very different path he's, he was much more he was a bit younger he was a bit more sort of refined you talk about like captain boomerang captain boomerang so yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Kangaroo. um he's a bit more he's a little more refined not not really but um he's definitely younger mm -hmm. and then i've seen him the audition and then they're like oh we, we, you know we'll have a callback and in the callback was amanda duaron and sam gill and manny was there and this was on Zoom, um, and I was in my booth, and uh, actually at my other house. And then they were like, "Oh yeah, so it's kind of like Fusey's. He's a bit older, and um, he's a bit of an avuncular, like an uncle type." And as soon as they said that, I was like, "Right, I I had done a lot of work before this on um, '70s Australian like cricket." heroes like some of the old like sporting heroes kind of like here where you have your baseball heroes of the you know 60s and 70s everyone knows who they are sometimes they get interviewed and they're big larger than life characters probably drink beers during the game whatever um and then my uncle my actual uncles i have two uncles and my dad very much are that kind of fused type you know um especially when they were younger not so much now they're more refined but back in the day you know every everything was kind of about just having a few laughs maybe playing a bit of backyard cricket and just like knocking about <laughs> you know and uh so that's what i put down in the in the callback and i was like i was like after the callback i was walked down i was like oh, i don't think i got this because i think i went too far like i, think I went too far into the the rough and tumble aussie direction and mm -hmm. then you know 
often you hang up from those calls and sometimes you hear back and sometimes you don't. Um, but yeah, I had, luckily the job went my way and then uh, we were recording like a, a few weeks later. But this was, I think we were in season five, so it was Loba season. Uh, bef- it was like May or something. I forget all the dates now, but when we were actually recorded. Um, and then in terms of the first recording, obviously super nervous. I'm like, I have to, there's something like 15, 1,000, yeah, 1,500 lines that require, most of them require two or three effort like, yeah. levels. Uh-huh. Yeah. And um, just getting through all of those and making them unique enough. And, and but, but I think once I'd hit on that idea of, the, you know, the uncle type, he just wants everyone to be like, to have a good time. And who does, you know, diffuse likes most people, you know, until Mad Maggie came along. Um, he had a bit of a thing with um, AJ Shea, like Lifeline. He was, there was a bit of a discomfort there, which I, I think we we sort of talked about and let in but as soon as i had the lowering the register channel that 70s australian knockabout you know lad and um and try and find the humor in each of the lines that's when it started to click you know Mm -hmm. yeah i i really i really enjoy just the the whole the whole thing when it comes to the interactions in between i am i am pretty curious about how was it joining such an amazing cast and like you guys are i've never seen a video game like this before i played a lot of video games i've never seen a cat you know how cool it is for every yeah like how cool it is to see all of you guys like if you like hang out or you and johnny and um (laughs) roger like or anyone just play video games together that is so so cool thanks man we have a lot of fun yeah no, I've never seen it before. The closest that I've come to it really is something like Red Dead Redemption. Um, Roger in, not Roger. Um, uh, Red, yeah, Roger Clark in that. Um, no, no Shia, um, a friend of mine who was in that. And sort of the, to come back to your earlier point, which is like, there are other games like your Valorant or your Call of Duties um, that don't have the lore and they don't have the characterization in the game. And as humans, like, I feel like, gaming has is now entering into an interesting part of the media landscape where it's actually getting closer to film mm-hmm. and tv it's maybe tv i imagine because because we're, we're starting to really align with characters even though these characters run around and shoot people and and you know all their simulacrums you know um the lore and the relationships that people people are starting to like get behind and be curious about and and you know you look at the, zeit, the new zeitgeist of TV, so Breaking Bad, and um, you can argue to even go back to um, you know The Sopranos, but then even all the the serial TV that's come out since, we've all got something that we can get behind because of that characterization and that deep investment that we can have with these characters on TV. We learn something about ourselves. We learn the function of drama, as far as I understand it, is that we learn to um, be prepared for and experience things that we wouldn't normally experience, so that when they actually happen we're, we're kind of prepared for them it's kind of a safety mechanism we enjoy it because it's like it's helping us feel safe it's a weird it's a weird sort of uh point to make but i i kind of believe in that and um and so to answer your question like what's it like to work with all these these actors it's it's fantastic because we all understand that the more work that we do um, to actually enrich those characters, um, which is informed 100% by the creators of the game and then the, the writers who work tirelessly to actually find points of conflict between characters or points of like, you know, um, coalescence, like relationships between characters. When it all comes out the pipe at the other end, there are so many people who've had their hands on it that um, it's a real, the team is just like crushing it. And by the time it, you know, and it's all often months after I've recorded a react a sort of interaction with another character that I even hear it in game. And I was like, man, I forgot I even recorded that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, it makes a lot of sense. Um, and, you know, it just, it's just also nice that there are people in this game that I hang out with and have a lot of fun with. And, you know, we're starting to head out to conferences and we're talking about doing other things. And it's, um, yeah, I just, I just wish the game a really long life. And um, it's, it's just a pleasure to be part of it, really. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. I'm so excited uh, for for conferences and stuff or like uh, just panels or just anything. Cause that would, 
I, I would love to go to one, especially talking to more and more of voice actors and just be able to, to finally meet people and and actually interact with someone in, in real life. After yeah, I, 100% after what we've sort of all been through. Yeah, because I, I started to get a following in quarantine. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. just like, I mean, I've been, it's not like I'm huge or anything, but I've been starting to grow in the past eight months maybe 10 at at the most like so i haven't got to do anything cool and like i just i want to do something cool you know yeah we um uh i get as part of the union i get tickets to um what they call for your consideration screenings of like mm -hmm. tv shows so there's a show called pen 15 uh, this show called The Great, and we'll go down to a cinema and sit and watch like the last episode of a show, and there'll be like the Emmy, Emmy like judges will be in the same audience, and then like someone from the show will come out and do a Q and A. Oh and yeah. For those, the creatives on those shows, they've never seen a live audience for their show. They just see these incredible numbers come through, the millions of people <laughs> watching, uh, and so they're they're humbled by. It. And so am I. Like I did uh, Supernova in Melbourne on the Gold Coast, um, and it was kind of freaky to see. It was great to just meet all the fans, but it was also freaky to see how nervous a lot of people get, you know? Yeah. Um, I used to get really nervous before doing these. Um, yeah, I think you, you probably develop an immunity to it when you realize that everyone is kind of the same. Well, it's it's not... I just really felt... I would always tell myself, and I there was one time, and I love to tell this story, I got... I was talking to these creators who are big creators in Valorant, like a pro player and then his girlfriend who are just massive creators, like bigger than life. I was so nervous. I was, I was shaking. I would, I didn't want to blow it. That's what my thing was. I had this opportunity and uh, some, by, by some chance, I got this opportunity to do this and I was shaking and I was sitting here. I had like a cold rag on my neck cause I was so hot. Uh, like genuinely, I didn't want to say anything like how nervous I actually was, but I called my mom and I was like, mom, like, I need some words right now. Like, I'm so nervous. And she just, she told me the best thing that she could have ever said. She's not in this space or anything. She doesn't know. But she said, she asked me a question. She said, D isn't this all you've ever wanted? And I was like, that's exactly what's, that's like, like, that's exactly what this is. And so I kind of like calmed down a bit. And then well, I just started talking. And then I, I felt like I crushed it. And um, now I just feel like, I've had what I feel like might be a peak for a little bit, but now everyone's just the person to me. Like it's not yeah. going to be any different than if I'm talking to my friend or not. Like everyone's people or everyone's a person, and yeah. and there's no real reason to to shut down. Yeah, I I, I have this weird kind of perverted thing that goes through my mind because there's probably like one or two people on the planet that i would like geek out over <laughs> but i just always just think weirdly in my mind everyone poops you know what i mean like everyone poops and you think about that you're like oh, the queen she poops i get it i mean maybe the queen does it. maybe she has someone in once a week to remember, I don't know, but like you know, yeah yeah, but yeah and, and also you're curious like you're a curious person and that, that mm -hmm. that's for me personally if i'm ever nervous i just put the focus on the other person um, mm -hmm. and and that's true that's true in performance as well like there have been times where i've walked out on stage and i'm like i don't know my first line i just don't know i don't know how i'm going to get through this show mm -hmm. and then as soon or, or i'll like fall out like i'll be middle of a scene and i'll like forget a line or something and i'll just be like oh, you're gonna do is just put that focus on the other person and it's uh you just become human again mm -hmm. I do, I, I feel like people would be mad if I, um, if I didn't have Fuse to say some lines right uh, now, man, so, <laughs> um, I, the first one I see is, uh, bloody hell, you look like bloody hell. Yeah. <laughs> bloody hell, you look like bloody hell. Mm. That's something that, that will never get old for me, is hearing the character say it in my ear directly for me. <laughs> Sam Gill wrote that line. It's still a classic. Yeah, um, it's a classic one. Yeah. What What are some that you um that you get pretty often that people want you to say? Um, the 
biggest, oh, the the biggest ones, are, well, the most popular ones are um, "Tell the Devil Few Sent You," which is probably the main one. Um, uh, "Hands Off," that's a prezi for Fusey. That one, yeah, that one's a classic one. Uh, putting the bomb in bombastic since twenty six eighty one. What else? And then sometimes people ask for like really long quotes because I'll do like streamily signings and stuff. Uh-huh. Um, uh, oh man. Oh yeah. What is it? Um, we having a, what is it? Having a barbecue after game. What are we talking? What? 60 steaks. But then they like put <laughs> two or three quotes together and I'm like, I'm writing, you know, I have like an 11 by 17 print, but I'm like, this is taking for a, this is taking a long time. Like, mm-hmm. you know, you get print by the time I've written on this. Um, yeah, there's, and then like, sometimes I actually have to go to wiki and just like, go, what are my lines again? Cause someone will be like, just put a random line down. And I'm like, someone asks for a random line. I'm just like, I don't know. My life's an open book. Just get your mom's permission to read it. Like, I just can't remember <laughs> any more lines than the ones I've already told you. Um, what you want to do Walter fuse Fitzroy at your bloody service. That's another one. Walter fuse Fitzroy at your bloody service. I I'm curious because I know that your uh that your sons uh, do both of them play. Yeah yeah um um hang on a sec this is my this is my baby girl come here baby. Oh. Oh you got a smoothie she likes to get a smoothie. <laughs> this is my baby girl this is Yoko. Hi. Say hi. 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 She gets embarrassed puts her hand on her. <laughs> no Ellie. she's very cute. Hi. She's very cute. Hi. Anyway, she's got a smoothie. She's got to get through. Yeah, so Tom plays. He gets a, he he plays uh, he plays a bit of Valorant too, and he's a really good Rocket League player. Oh. But he gets triggered by Apex. Lockie doesn't get so triggered, and he's he's probably the better player. Like he'll he'll um he'll drop a, a twelve a twelve bomb. That's that's his kind of. Oh, he's probably dropped bigger than that. But Tom will just get triggered. So we'll play for like five minutes and then he'll be like, all right, let's go and play Red Dead or, you know, Fortnite or something. So Lucky just introduced me to Fortnite No Build the other day and we're like, we got our, got our first dub. Uh, uh, do you, as long as I don't have to build, I'm fine. Yeah, do, uh, do you ever pull out the, the Fuse voice with them? Are they ever like, Dad, like, stop, like, stop with that? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. 100%. <laughs> like, um, Although I think there's still a little bit of kind of pride, I guess. Oh yeah, think, absolutely. Like, Lucky gets it at school. Like people, Lucky, because he's finishing up high school um, mm-hmm. this year, and he gets the um, kids come up to him and, and they call him son of Fuse, and so he's, but he sort of says it like he's a bit proud of it. Yeah, um, I mean it's cool. It's cool. Yeah, yeah he's got a minor celebrity at his. <laughs> um, yeah, but there when we play in a three stack, um, we. We don't usually get a win, but we definitely do pretty well. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's also, so there's this, uh, I don't know if you've ever heard it. Um, there's a character in Valorant who's also um, Australian. Her name's Sky in Valorant. And she's oh. she's one of my best friends. Um, she was the first person I did, the uh, for, first voice actor I did a podcast with. Um, okay. And her, her real name is Miranda O'Hare. And um, I learned... From her, because Fuse has a voice line, a bit of hard yakka. Yeah, yeah. Which I learned what that meant from her. Um, Amazing. I didn't know there was an Australian in Valorant. Yeah, history. I think... Yeah. And I could be wrong, and I hope that I, I'm correct on this. I think she's from Sydney. Yeah. Um, um, but yeah, she's, she's, also, she's also in LA now. Um, which I was literally just texting her before this. Because I was asking her a couple days ago about the... the if I wanted to know about the distribution of, of population and if people went to uh, Western Australia or not, I was very curious about that. So, um, yeah, she, she said that because uh, I asked her if she traveled, if she had traveled most of Australia and she said that, yeah, and she knows a lot of people who have. So it's like pretty common to like yeah. go to major cities. I just didn't know if people like if you were from like the the eastern side if you have what's on the way west is it perth on the perth's on the west yeah yeah so i didn't know if like if it was just like oh yeah i've been there for like a layover or something and then i flew out or 
you know, whatever the case may be. Like, I just didn't know if people traveled and been like, oh, yeah, like, we go yeah. over I mean, there. It, it, it has its own, like, I mean, it's literally on the West Coast, so the sun sets over the ocean. That doesn't happen anywhere else in Australia unless it's, like, some weird town in a cove or something. Mm -hmm. uh, they have some of the best beaches in the world. They have, like, black cockatoos and um, crazy, they have different, they have different, trees and different wildlife and kind of different soil as well it's more like a ready soil for the most part mm -hmm. um, and it's so vast like there's just so much out there but I, I mean i don't know i couldn't say but i wouldn't say like tons of people go holidaying in perth but definitely like if you're interested in the country you'll have been there a couple of times for whatever reason mm. um, and it's not even a layover situation because most flights go okay east, you know so you're yeah. traveling east out over the pacific into like la um but yeah, that's that's uh, so great. Tell her I said hi. <laughs> um, yeah, but hard yakka. I, I don't know with a because there's a there's a, a set of uh, a pair of jeans called hard yakkas. Yep, I knew I knew this. I and knew I this. Didn't know what came first, the saying or the jeans? Mm. Um, but yeah, bit of hard yakka. Uh, crazy in there. Yeah, well, let's get, let's get that one, and then uh, if we can, if I can find another one, then we'll get one, and then we'll we'll wrap this up. But uh, it's a bit of hard yakka and the wind is ours. Bit of hard yakka and the wind's ours. Yeah. And ours is an interesting word because you, you can do it as ours or ours. Uh, bit of hard yakka and the wind's ours. You wouldn't say that in Australia, mm -hmm. but it's more recognizable for an American. But yeah, that's a good one. Um. I don't know if I can. I'm trying to find one, but nothing's really jumping out at me. If you if you have anything, if you want to just throw, yeah. I do. I don't want to give you such a long one because it's so hard to remember stuff like that. But um, what about you want to do? Congratulations! You just <laughs> called in the big guns. Congratulations, bloody lations. You just called in the big guns. All uh, right. And you, you, I, I love when I um, meet someone or talk to someone and, and they just blow my expectations out of the water. You are such a, a sweet guy and I, I absolutely enjoyed talking to you. I also enjoyed a lot of learning about you beforehand um, in, in your career. Thank you. Thanks, Owen. And like, you have done the most research of anyone, I think, who's, who's interviewed me. Um, and I have not listened to any of the press that I did since like being in, in Apex. Mm -hmm. um, and so I don't know what I've said out there. <laughs> it's like, I don't know what that is. So it's like, all I can do is, you know, you know, yeah. talk about stuff that I know about. But, um, yeah, like, but I, at the same time, I feel like my journey is kind of just starting as well. It's a weird, Absolutely. It's a weird thing. To yeah. Be in age of life and going oh yeah we're just starting out down this path so mm -hmm. um thanks man i appreciate it yeah I, I didn't want to give you i don't want to give you i didn't want to put out content that everyone could have just went and watched a different interview right. of so i don't know i thought i i tried to do what i tried to do i don't know if it worked or not but i hope we talked about things that you you were not tired of talking about no i think it was good i i'm, I'm impressed i'm impressed thank you Thank you. Um, I appreciate everyone for, for watching and uh, you can find all Ben's links um, down in the description, but uh, I think maybe you might already be, be following him. But if you're not, go ahead and follow. Uh, and yeah, I'll see you guys next time. This has been Texture and Ben. I'm out. Peace.